Hello! And I have an interesting book today for you in what is... must be... Twenty-six. A book or two to review. Twenty-six. Goodness gracious me. How to Survive in Medieval England by Tony Mount. Now, when I got sent this book, I was going, this is either going to be great, or it's going to be sent back. I was very, very happy. It was great. The era, here are some of the chapter titles, and this was already what put me to these. Um, chapter 1. Introduction. Setting the scene. Preparation for your German journey. It is your duty to work. Chapter 2. Social structure and housing. Class structure. How did the poor live? Class structure. How did the wealthy live? Class structure. How did the middling sort live? Mind your language is the next chapter. Chapter 3. Beliefs and religious ideas. Work and holidays. Fasting. Sex. What would be my beliefs about death and the dead? How would I deal with death? How would I worship? Chapter 4. Clothing and appearance. Sumptuary laws. What kind of clothes would I wear? Lacings. Where would I get my clothes? How would I look after them? How would I look after my skin and hair? Chapter 5. Food and shopping. What would I eat? Staple foods. Bread and ale. How would I cook food? How would I buy food and goods? Money. Weights and measures. Chapter 6. Health medicine. What diseases would I be most vulnerable to? How healthy would I be? What is my life expectancy? How useful are physicians? What is the difference between a physician and a surgeon? Chapter 7. Work and leisure. 88. What is the attitude to work? What kinds of jobs are available? What kinds of jobs are available to women? Them souls. What do women do if they have no job? What entertainment available? How would I relax? Chapter 8. Family matters. Marriage. Divorce. How are women treated? How are children treated? How are children educated? Pets. Chapter 9. Warfare. How often would I go to war? What type of warfare would I practice? Studying the art of war. What are my chances of survival? How would I be treated as a veteran? Chapter 10. Law and order. How would I behave as a citizen? How is the country policed? The pie powder courts. How are criminals prosecuted? Out on bail? Forest law? Oddities of the law? Now. I have to admit, I was tempted, very tempted, to push the boundaries of YouTube and go for chapter three, part three, sex. But if you want to hear that chapter, comment below. I'll put it up as a definitely not for children. So I'm going to do pets. Because the floppy research assistant basically ordered to me to. So that starts on page 114, and it is a cool section. Pets. You'll discover that medieval folk live closely alongside animals. A poor family may share their home with a cow or a goat and a few chickens, sharing warmth in the winter and safety at night. Horses and oxen plough and pull carts. Dogs guard property and herd sheep. A knight has his distraer. And a miller has his cat has cats to keep the vermin from the grain. And also provide food, clothing, and carry burdens. However, we have another need. Companionships and pets of many kinds to fill this need. Cats and small dogs are most popular pets, but squirrels, birds, badgers, and even monkeys and popping jays, parrots amuse their uh, amuse their owners. Providing comfort and demonstrating their status. In Leonardo da Vinci's painting of a lady with an ermine, a tame stoat with fur to trim the most luxurious of gardens is obviously included to show the sitter's nobility. Cats are a conundrum to medieval minds. They're useful as they catch mice and rats, and cat's fur is one of the few skins that lower class folk can wear for warmth, according to sumptuary laws of 1363. But cats have a devilish side. Edward, Duke of York, wrote a book about hunting, The Master of Game, in the early 15th century, and noted, if any beast have the devil's spirit, it is the cat. Explained, a cat torments a mouse or a bird before eating it, just as the devil torments sinners before swallowing them down into hell. However, cats can redeem their reputations. Exeter Cathedral has cats on the payroll, receiving 1D per week to supplement their diet of rats and mice and a cat-sized hole, or lets them come through the wall of the north transept in pursuit of the vermin. 
According to a 13th century guide for women who became anchoresses, uh, the Akrin Riel, cats are the only companions permitted to them in a self-imposed solitary confinement, but they must not give love to the cats that more rightly belongs to God. The Countess Eleanor, wife of Simon de Montfort, bought a cat for 2D in 1265. However, others thought their cats were more valuable. In 1294, William Yingnes brought a case, a court case against his neighbours, who took his cat and now were worth at least 6D, according to William. Judging by my knowledge of cats, are we sure that the cat didn't take a new owner? In an English bestiary of the early 30th century, cats are given the briefest mention. And thanks to the lively imagination of the illuminator of the manuscript, the accompanying miniature is more informative. The cat il illustration shows three cats, two grey and one black, against a dark blue background, with a design of moons and stars in gold to indicate the animal's nocturnal activities. One grey cat has caught a large mouse, or a rat in its paws. The black cat is demonstrating its cleverness, we're trying to open a cage to get at the small bird within, and we are all familiar with the third cat, also grey, curled up asleep, choosing the, ch uh, the cosiest place in the house next to the fire. The illuminator shows more about cats than the author of the manuscript. The same author is obviously a dog lover, and in the bestiary of dogs, receives six pages of text. There is nothing wrong with being a dog lover, according to the floppy research assistant. In fact, according to the floppy research assistant, both of them, in chorus, being a dog lover is the more normal thing. They track creatures of the forest using their sense of smell, guard, sheep, and their master's property, as well as defending their owners. So far, so good. Unfortunately, so the author says, puppies' tongues are an excellent cure for wounds of the intestines, since dogs can heal wounds by licking them. In a medieval medical text, a remedy for gout consisted solely of boiled puppies too young to have their eyes open. That author should be found and this whip rip ripped from history. Our best year author tells a number of classical tales concerning dogs so loyal that they refuse to leave their dead or dying masters. However, the historical example shows this wasn't always the case. You know, King Richard II had a pet dog called Math. The animal was with the king when his cousin, Henry Bonboat, took him prisoner and demanded the English crown. When Richard, fi Richard finally gave in to Henry's demands, Maff deserted his previous master and went to Henry's side. Assuming the title Henry IV, apparently, the new king took Maff's change of loyalty as a good omen for his reign and the loyalty of England to the new regime. I think he had some stake in his pocket. Matters didn't work out quite as well as Henry hoped. Dogs are not infallible when it comes to foreseeing the future. Again, do not tell my fluffy research assistants this. Lap dogs are a useful accessory for fine ladies. Not only are they status symbols and companions, in cold drafty castles they make the, near, the perfect living hot water bowls to warm the ladies' hands or feet. Sunday little ladies adore the little lap dogs to the extent that they want them included in their memorials and tombs. To be remembered forever alongside their mistress. The Arnold tomb in Chichester Cathedral in Sussex shows a dog keeping his ladies' feet warm for eternity. At St George's Church in Trotton, also in Sussex, the early 14th century memorial brass of Margaret, Lady Camoys, also has a little dog at her feet. And at Norbury in Derbyshire, Margaret Fitzherbert is accompanied in their death by a tiny dog. Elsewhere, clerics, dukes and knights are depicted on tombs and brasses with their favourite pooches. But this wasn't just an English tradition. French nobles and their wives and the Counts of Flanders and their ladies all wanted their pets company in hereafter. This is a fun book. This is a really fun book. Again. It's just fun to read. And it's worthwhile reading. It is kind of interesting, I have to admit, is that I thought, and I don't know, that Tony Mount is a she. She's a member, uh, as an author of historical nonfiction and teacher, she's a member of the Richard III Society's Research Committee, a costume interpreter at historical events, and belongs to the Crime Writers Association. She writes regularly for the history magazines, has produced online courses for www.medievalcourses.com, and creates the Sebastian Foxley medieval murder mystery novels. Tony has a master's degree in medieval medicine, diplomas in literature, creative writing, European humanities, and a PGCE. She lives in Kent with her husband. It's a very cool book. And it's lovely. There is only one small error in the entire book that I've spotted. 
The right of Tony Mount to be identified as author of this work has been asserted by him in accordance with the Copyright Designs and Patents Acts, 1988. It's a good book. It's worth reading. Tony, she's a great author. I want to read more books by her, and I'm hoping they'll be sent to me. Just hoping they might fix the thing at the front. Right, this is going to be a quick one. Almost sent about a second book, but I'm not going to because. Well, each book deserves its own time. Take care, thank you, and I hope you enjoyed.